What do you guys think? Can my ability to spin the ball around the racket, particularly without looking, showcase all the major functions of the cerebellum? Let's find out. All right, guys, welcome to Psych Explained. In this video, we're gonna dive into the cerebellum. Now, one of the reasons I really enjoy talking about the structure is because it's impossible to imagine life without it. From driving a car, to riding a bike, to going for a jog, to playing a musical instrument, the cerebellum is at the root of all that. All right, let's get started. Now, in this video, we're gonna focus on three primary functions of the cerebellum, but first, let's start in this structure here. Let's understand where the cerebellum is located and also its surrounding parts. Now, a nice way to think about the brain is that it's divided into three major parts. One of those is being the cerebellum. Now, the largest part of the brain, this giant mass here, is what we call the cerebrum, all right? This whole structure, and we can label it over here. Okay, so here is the cerebrum. Now, what do we know about the cerebrum? We know that's divided into two hemispheres. We have our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere. We also know that the top of the cerebrum is covered by a thin layer of gray matter called the cerebral cortex, right? When you close your eyes and you envision the brain, it's got a lot of wrinkles and folds. That's the cortex of the brain. And we can kind of draw that cortex to showcase those folds and those wrinkles, and that sits on top of the cerebrum. Now, what does the cortex do? Well, the cerebral cortex is responsible for higher functions, things like learning and organizing and decision making and problem solving, and even things like speech and processing vision. You could also think about the cortex that is divided into four lobes, and it's always important to practice those lobes, so do it with me. We have our frontal lobe, we have our temporal lobes, we have our parietal lobes, and we have our occipital lobe, which sits in the back of the head, all right? So there's our cerebrum, that's our largest structure. Our second structure is located right be below the cerebrum. I like to call this the survival structure. It is also the oldest structure here in green, and we call this the brainstem, the brainstem. Now, why do I call it the survival structure? Well, quite simply, the things that we need to survive are located within the brainstem, like breathing and heart rate or if you've ever choked on food and you have that reflex to cough to get the food out, you could thank your brainstem for that. Now, another way to think about the brainstem is kind of this connector. And what I mean by that is that it connects the cerebrum, the top of the brain, to the lower body, right? So everything that flows or sends up to the cerebrum or goes down or descends has to flow through the brainstem. So we have a lot of information that goes through there, all right? So we have the cerebrum and we have the brainstem. Now, directly behind the brainstem, right in the back of the head, and underneath the cerebrum, more specifically the occipital lobe, is our main structure for today, and that is in red. And this is the cerebellum. Let's make sure we write that there. Cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum comes from the word meaning little brain. Now, why is it called little brain? Because of its striking resemblance to the cortex of the brain right? In other words, in this picture, it looks very smooth, right? There's nothing there, but it's actually got a cortex. It's got a lot of folds and wrinkles similar to the cerebral cortex that sits on the cerebrum. It is packed with neurons, right? I'll say a general rule of thumb. If you're a teacher or you're reading in a textbook and they say a part of the brain is packed with neurons, you know that plays a vital role in everything we do, All right? So here's our cerebellum. So we have the cerebrum, we have our brainstem, and our cerebellum, our three main parts. Now, a nice way to think about the cerebellum as well, and I'll draw an arrow to this structure right here. You know, I feel like a lot of times we look at the brain, it always looks like this. That doesn't really do justice. I think whenever you look at the brain, you should always look at it from multiple angles. So what do you notice here? Like what kind of, what differences do you notice between this figure and this figure? Well, it shows us is that we have two cerebellum, right? We have two hemispheres, our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere, which sends we have two, we have a cerebellum on our left and our cerebellum on our right. So this person would be facing this way and this would be the back of the head, all right? We'll also talk about why it's important to know this because as information flows up through the brain or descends down, it's gonna go to different hemispheres and we'll dive into that in a moment. All right, so there we go. We have our three main structures. We have looking at the cerebellum from multiple angles and actually we can add the folds here as well, right? So we know we have, we have our right cerebellar cortex and our left cerebellar cortex so we can visualize that as well. All right, all right, let's dive into the major functions. All right, the first function of the brainstem, oh, sorry, of the cerebellum, is what we're gonna say is balance 
and posture. Okay, balance and posture is the first major function. Now, what do we mean by balance? Well, my ability to stand up without falling over, right? I have a good sense of equilibrium. I'm able to walk straight, right, in a nice straight line. If you have cerebellar damage, it's very hard to walk in a straight line, okay? So this is what we mean by balance, right? If you do yoga, you do sports, and you're kind of moving your body, that is all balance. Now, how does the cerebellum play a role in balance? Well, here's what I want you to think about. There are three primary systems, and the cerebellum is influenced or communicates with all three symptoms. We're gonna go over them, and at the end, I want you to remember and talk back to me, what are those three systems, okay? So I want you to remember that we have three of them. Okay, here's the first one. Well, let's say, for example, you wanna lift your leg in the air, okay? So I have a nice lift, and I have to have nice bounce. Well, how does that reach the cerebellum? Well, we have receptors all over our body. We have receptors right underneath my skin that pick up things like temperature, hot and cold, or pain or vibrations. We also have sensory receptors within the skin attached to my muscles, my ligaments, my muscles, and my joints. And what we call these, I'll have my little dots here, we call these proprioreceptors, okay, proprioreceptors. Now, proprioreception is essentially our awareness in space, right? I know where my legs are, I know where my limbs are, this is proprioreception. All right, and we can write this here, pro, prio, receptors. Okay, so here's the first one, receptors. So what happens? Well, as my leg lifts in the air, this information has to reach the cerebrum. And that information is going to go up from my muscles, from my ligaments, from my limbs, all the way to our central nervous system. And we'll have an arrow so we know that this is going up. Okay, so where does it go from there? Well, this is going to go up or ascend to the brainstem, and once it reaches the brainstem, it's going to synapse with another neuron, okay? So it's going to synapse with another neuron, and that information is going to continue to flow to the cerebrum. Now, there are two main parts this is going to flow to. It's going to go to the sensory cortex, okay? This is the part of the brain that registers and integrates sensory information, right? Hot and cold and temperature, uh, pain and vibrations, everything goes there. So this is going to flow through the thalamus, okay, all of our senses flow through, uh, through the thalamus except for smell, and then eventually synapse with the sensory cortex, okay? So this lets you know that your leg's in the air. What's also going to happen is this message is going to flow and communicate and synapse with your cerebellum as well. So that's make sure that we have our legs in the air and we're nice and balanced. All right, so there's our appropriate reception. That is our first part of balance. All right, what's our second part? Well, have you ever tried to stand still with your eyes closed with, with your leg in the air? I want you to try it at home, okay? Put your leg in the air, which you probably can't see, and close your eyes. It's really hard to do, okay? And that is why our second system, our visual system, plays a key role in balance. So our eye would be around here, and we'll use a different marker, and essentially our eye is gonna take information and send it out to different areas of the brain, okay? One of those, of course, being the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is going to pick up information from our visual system as well. All right, so we have our proprioceptors, we have our visual system. So what's our third system? What's the third system that helps with balance? It's our ear. Specifically, our inner ear, or what's called the vestibular system, okay? So as I turn my head and do this with my, with my head, my ear is signaling my brain where my head is in space, and that's going to help with balance as well. So there's our three. We have proprioceptors, we have our visual system, and we have our vestibular system. Now this angle over here, this diagram, this is also really nice to look at these three systems, right? This kind of, you know, it's, it's easy to see here, but it's better to see when you have two hemispheres. Okay, so here's our example. We have our inner ear, and let's say our inner ear is on the right side. This is our vestibular system. Well, where's this information going to go? Well, the information is going to flow to the spinal cord right through the brain stem and that's going to ascend go up to the brain now remember everything's crisscrossed what do i mean by that well if it's from the right ear this information is going to flow, go flow to the left hemisphere right the auditory cortex of the left hemisphere the auditory cortex of the left hemisphere right everything is crisscrossed or let's say my left leg is raised okay so here's my left leg Okay, those proprioceptors are gonna go up my spinal cord through my brainstem, right? They'll sign with another neuron. Now, where do you think it's gonna go? If, it's, if the information is from my left leg, where's the information gonna go? It's gonna go to my right hemisphere, right? And it's gonna go to what part? My sensory cortex of my right hemisphere. My sensory cortex. Oh. 
And of course, this will communicate with our you know, cerebellum as well, okay? So that's a really nice way to think about it, right? I always say this, don't just look at the brain from one angle, look at it from multiple angles, that will really help you, okay? All right, so there's number one. We have balance and our cerebellum plays a vital role. All right, our second main function, and we're gonna write this, is called coordinated, coordinated movement, okay? Make sure I got there. There we go. Coordinated movement. All right, let's break this apart to make sense of what I mean by this. Let's start with movement. Now, when I talk about movement, I mean voluntary movement, right? I choose to lift my arms when I'm lifting weights. I choose to move my head, right? I choose to lift my leg. This is what we call voluntary movement. Involuntary would be something like blinking. You don't think about it. It just happens. We also have coordinated right? This means that things are in sync with each other, right? I can touch my nose when I choose to. I could do it at the same time. This is coordinated. Or I could have my finger out here and move it and touch it as it moves. This is coordination, okay? So how does this play a role in the cerebellum? Or how does the cerebellum help with coordinated movement? Well, let's start up here, okay? When your muscles move, it has to start from what we call the motor cortex. And that's what I have up here in purple. And this is located in our can you think about what lobe? It is our frontal lobe, okay? So this is in our frontal lobe. Our sensory cortex is in our parietal lobe. Okay, so we have our primary motor cortex. And this is gonna send information through the body to move our muscles. So we go through our thalamus, as we all do. Okay, everything goes through the thalamus, and then that is going to continue down. Now here's what happens. As that information flows down to our muscles, it is also going to make a pit stop, so to speak, at our cerebellum, okay? In other words, as the information flows down, your motor cortex is communicating with your cerebellum, telling the cerebellum what it's doing. You know, it's almost like this, you know, back and forth conversation. Hey, cerebellum, I just want to let you know I'm going to go put the leg down. Are you okay with that, right? The cerebellum will talk back. Yes, you can do it. I just got to make sure there are no errors and everything is coordinated, right? So you kind of got this back and forth communication going. So this information is going to continue to descend, flow down. It will synapse with another neuron and go down to our leg. It will make sure we have arrow going this way so you know it's going down. And it'll go to the leg, right? And that might, you know, maybe I'm putting my foot down there, okay? So that's a nice way to think about coordinated movement. It's not just your motor cortex. It's got to communicate with the cerebellum and let the cerebellum know what's happening so there are no errors and everything is fluid. And then your cerebellum will communicate back to the motor cortex saying, Everything okay, you can do it now, I agree, okay? So there we go, we have coordinated movement. All right, what is our third function? Well, our third function is what we call motor learning. Now, what do I mean by motor learning? Motor learning, you wanna think about muscle memory, right? This essentially is doing a task without much effort. For my musicians and my athletes, you know about this, right? Whenever you start a skill, it's really hard, it's really taxing, right? Dribbling a basketball, playing guitar, playing piano, you have to think about it, right? But the more you do it, it becomes more fluid, right? Essentially, it becomes just this repetitive motion and you don't even have to think about it, right? How many of you can text on your phone without looking, right? That's motor learning. And your cerebellum plays a vital role in that. Now, another way to think about this, kind of a subcategory, is what we call implicit memories implicit memories, right? In other words, whenever I think about memories and I talk to my students, they always go, oh, the hippocampus, the hippocampus. Well, not necessarily. Not all memories are created equal. Yes, your hippocampus plays a role in forming new memories, explicit memories, but when it comes to memories you don't really think about, driving a car, riding a bike, your cerebellum plays a bigger role, all right? So that's a nice way to think about it. So nice summary, we have balance, we have coordinated movement, and we have motor learning. Those are three functions. Now, I asked you at the beginning, let me get my tennis racket out, my little tennis ball. How can this motion, let's do it together, how can the cerebellum be used to explain how I can do this with my racket? Okay, let's think about it. First, we have balance, okay? So I'm able to balance the ball, right? I have nice equilibrium, I'm moving, right? But the ball's not falling over. Uh, we have proprioceptors. receptors in my muscles, sending information to my brain and communicating with my cerebellum as well. So I know where everything is, right? My sensory cortex helps me feel the racket. There we go. Uh, other things, we have vision, right? I'm looking at it. Okay, I'm looking at it. And also my inner ear, right? I can turn my head and my brain knows. All right, coordinated movements. Okay, well, I have my motor cortex sending information down my brain, down my arm. 
allowing me to move my muscles. Okay, this is my motor cortex. And to make sure that I don't go too fast or too slow and I have no airs, that's where my cerebellum comes in. So it's not just my motor cortex controlling my muscles, my cerebellum makes sure that my wrists don't go too far, right? And the ball falls off. And lastly, motor learning. If you've ever tried something for the first time, you know how hard it is. Now I play tennis for quite a while, okay? And I'll do this with uh, some of my players that I coach. And it's hard at first, right? It's something that you have to really think about and you make a lot of errors. But over time, right, I can look at you and I can still do this because essentially it's muscle memory, right? I'm not really thinking about it. It just kind of happens, all right? So there is our three. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I really hope you took something away. Don't forget to like the video, comment below, and also subscribe. Until next time.